Yeah, good day all. It's, uh, I'm Robert Justice. I'm going to talk a bit about using the FujiNet with the Apple III. Um, a little bit of a recap of the FujiNet over the last year, what's been done, um, hardware to use with the Apple III, and then a bit of the software to get it all to work, and then we'll do a bit of a demo through it. Okay, doke. All right, so FujiNet, <laughs> lots of hard work being done over the past year. Um, smart port updates using hardware SPI. I'm quite sure if that was done last year or not. Had the floppy emulation. Jeff's added that in using the remote transmitter function to get the continuous bit stream for the tracks. Support for WAS and disk images. Um, all the other devices have been hooked up, print to modem, et cetera. Check some support, retry for smart port to help reliability. Uh, had to work around a 2GS ROM3 bug. Uh, there's been a 2GS CDA version of the config written and a nice AppleSoft ampersand library that's had a lot of work done to, to get the network device working from basic. Um, you can see it's pretty much runs on a lot of the Apple platforms, uh, 2GS, ROM 1, 3, 2C, 2C+, plus. And then if we use soft SP and disk control to controller or Liron or Yellowstone, then you can use it on the other slot-based machines. So a big thank you to the FujiNet team uh, for all your hard work, Tom and all the other guys there. Thank you. So this was just to try and give a bit of a map of what's there, uh, Apple current state. So we've got four block devices. Uh, that can grab the images off internet-based TNFS server or off a local SD, uh, printer emulator. So these yellow ones are character-based smart port devices, which uh, as far as we're aware, these are the only character devices out there. Um, modem emulator for telnetting to BBSs, network emulator, so this is, uh, handles lots of protocols and uh, and get FujiNet to JSON passing, lots of stuff. Uh, Network-based clock, CPM emulator, runs CPM on the FujiNet, and uses the smart port as terminal interface. And then the disk 2 emulation, so it can do two floppies and supporting disk and WAS images sourced from internet-based TNFS server or, or local SD card. So there's a lot packed in there um, into that little FujiNet device. So the hardware, so um, Rev1 hardware is nearly ready. Uh, just needs a bit more final testing. Um, I've got one here I'll use for my demo later. Um, you can see here's a few options. This 19 pin adapter can plug on the front here, go in the back of the 2C, 2C plus. Um, then there's an adapter cable to extend this for other computers to fit easy, the 2E. And then I've got a 26 pin to 20 pin, so I can plug it into the floppy port on the on the Apple III. So what do we need to use it on the Apple III? So from a hardware point of view, we've got two options at the moment, a Liron card, uh, that will give you the smart port only, um, or we can use the soft SP and uh, do, or do, do we DIY soft SP. Um, I've got a, this on a Grappler Plus that I'll be using. Um, this will give you smart port and floppy support, and it uses the internal floppy Apple III floppy controller. Uh, I've got, I'm just using a straight adapter because I'm only using one floppy drive, or you can use this nice adapter that's been made uh, available on GitHub here, the details, here it is here. Um, Yellowstone has some sort of issue with the SOS HD boot, so that's uh, to be worked on. Okay, so from a software, so we need a, a SOS driver. So Apple III uses drivers to, to isolate out the, all of the devices from the OS, provide a common interface. So we've got some examples here, console, printer, audio, profile. So just this one here was just to try and depict the, the, what would have been a case for the, say the RS-232 driver. So in the original would have had the driver, would have had a physical serial card, RS-232 connection, external modem and a phone line. With FujiNet will have its driver, uh, talking to smart port card, smart port bus, 
modem emulation in the FujiNet, and then Telnet via the internet. So as long as we've got this common interface here, from an application point of view, it shouldn't really care which one it's using. So from a driver interface into SOS, I just wanted to touch on this. So we have read, write commands, status and control. So these status, one byte status code sent, and then the driver gives you back some data. And then you can send a control code with control data. So you'll, anyone familiar with SmartPort will see that this looks a bit familiar. So if we go to the next one, this is a bit of a comparison. So this is the SOS draw device driver interface here and, and, the, and the smart port firmware interface. So they're, they're similar. They've split the read block, write block out and read and write for character devices. Um, status and control are, are basically the same. So it's fairly easy. So we should be able to just map these across, yeah? So there's a little bit more to that, but it wasn't too bad. Um, I've just got a couple of scenarios here just to sort of show a couple of things that I found. When we were using for FujiNet Apple II apps, we, when you're just reading some data from a device, so you've got to find out, is there any data there? So we, we send a status request. Is there any bytes waiting to the FujiNet? And then either get, there's no bytes or we get X bytes and then we read it. So what I found with the, some of the Apple III programs that they'll do a read request for a chunk of bytes. And then if there's none available, you'll just get zero bytes returned. When there is some, the actual bytes transferred is indicated back in the SOS call. So that does its polling via just read, no bytes, read, no bytes, read, and then get a chunk of bytes. So uh, I had to update FujiNet to handle this case. And then this was another alternative that EasyTerm was doing. So the original RS-232 driver for SOS would have had interrupt driven, you know, receive buffer. Uh, so it would do a call status request three, which gives back the RXTX buffer status. So we don't have that as such. So inside the driver, it's just translating it to do a, a status request to the FujiNet, getting back bytes waiting and then sort of simulating the response to say that RX buffers got X bytes, it's zero or, or so many. And then the program just reads. So it was a couple of little cases to handle, but, but nothing too major. So we have the current status of the FujiNet driver. Um, we've got the printer RS232 mapped to FujiNet modem, CPM for the CPM emulator, clock and the network driver. And then I'm just using at the moment, um, the first two smart port block devices will work with the SOS HD boot and it's included driver. There is a bit of a, a work in progress version that will use four smart port block devices, but I, I, I'm not gonna really touch on that today. Okay, and then the other aspect, so we had a driver, then we've got this config program that we've got to get running from FujiNet. So config is written in C using CC65, um, uses Apple II console routines in the F8 ROM for screen and keyboard, directly talks to smart port firmware interface. Um, so we use this to configure the Wi-Fi and set up host and disk images. Uh, it's hosted on the first smart port block device. <laughs> Excuse me. So currently there's no CC65 support for Apple III target. So how do we do it? So one thought I had was maybe we can use the Apple II emulation to run it. But normally that on the, on the Apple III needs a, uh, a floppy and then boot. So I'll show you what I've come up with for that. Um, and the other aspect is we've got to get it to boot off a smart port device. So we can just reuse the SOS HD boot that I've written, ROM and the updated SOS to do that. So that'll work just straight in there. So just a bit of a recap. There's a couple of slides here, I'll get through them. Um, the original uh, Prodot, when Prodot's come out, they had this dual boot capability so we could um, 
depending on the entry point into the bootloader, yeah, um, we could determine whether we're running on an Apple II or an Apple III and then load the appropriate operating system. So we've backed off on that a little bit and then we've slightly modified the bootloader so that when we take the Apple III path, rather than load the SOS operating system, we're, we're loading this Apple III sort of Apple II emulation contained in a file. So that's just basically setting up exactly what the Apple II emulation mode, with one exception, it leaves it in this, this Satan mode so we can reboot back into Apple III mode without having to power off. So we do all that setup, and then we go back, reboot as an Apple II, and then we load in config, the config program and run it. And that way on an Apple II, we just take this path direct. On the Apple III, we, we do this circular route. I'll just do a little recap on the, 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 SOS, the standard boss SOS boot setup. <laughs> Too many acronyms. So it had a ROM that would just look to floppy drive one off the bootloader, the bootloader off floppy drive one, load in the SOS kernel file from floppy drive one. And then the loader part of the SOS kernel uses SOS calls to load in the application, the SOS interpreter, and the rest of the SOS drivers by using a floppy driver that's baked into the SOS kernel. So there was no real way until you get all this loaded that you can use any other device. So the, the SOS HD boot had a modified ROM to go look for a block device, load a bootloader, which would then load a SOS kernel off the block device. And in that modified SOS kernel, it has a block device driver rather than the floppy. So then the loader can then grab these other files off a block device. So this will, uh, this will work sort of nicely with our config program and with the rest of FujiNet to get the images up. So I've got some reference links here. FujiNet driver, pre-built images are on this site. FujiNet wiki, a little bit about link to SOS HD boot and that file-based Apple II emulator that was written to get the config up. So there we go. Let's, let's have a bit of a run through it working. Yeah, hi all, welcome to the demo part. Um, I've got my Apple III here. I've got a soft SP on a Grappler Plus card inside and I've got the FujiNet connected using a 26 pin to 20 pin cable connected to the internal floppy port. Um, and I've got a video, I've got an RGB to HDMI on the back of it and it's hooked into a converter, HDMI converter to get onto my laptop here. So you get some nice crisp video. Okay, let's um let's kick it off. So I'll just reboot the reset on the Apple and that brings us up to the config. So the FujiNet config allows us to configure you know Wi-Fi settings, connect to the network. SSIDs, if I hit C for config, you can see its IP address that it's currently got and what I'm connected to. So this allows you to do it all on screen, no other secondary display needed. Um, it uses the concept of hosts where we source the, the images from and then slots to put them in. Um, smart port host uh, drive slot sorry and these two drive slots so let's pick uh here. i'm going to use a, a local tnfs server from melbourne that seems to work a little bit better for me and i can just drop stuff on and off myself easily so let's just hit that three through net and then i've got some pre-prepared images these are on the on the FujiNet GitHub site. I'm gonna use this SOS selector one. Hit that. Now, if I hit enter, it'll mount it as read only. If I hit W, it'll mount it as read write. Um, I must've been playing with a floppy here. So I'm just gonna go down here and eject, hit E to eject that one. So we've just got the one drive in the first smart port slot. 
and then we hit escape and boot it up. Now, once you boot up, if you don't power down the FujiNet, um, then the next time you reboot, it won't go back into config. It'll just go straight into whatever you selected. Now, I will reboot one more time. I want to show you something on the, the driver. If I reboot. Control key down here. Um, the SOS HD boot gives a driver print. I just wanted to show this. So we've got the network driver, printer, CPM, RS-232, and the FujiNet clock. And then these first two block devices will map to the FujiNet smart port uh, slots for drives. So I'll hit that. I've also got FujiNet cam running. <laughs> Not sure how successful that will be, but you'll see some activity there anyway. So let's go. Let's first thing we'll... So just before we start, this is running in selector three. So that was like a program selector menu type thing uh, because the Apple three didn't have a command line interface as such, then these were quite popular. There was another one, Catalyst, that was used, that was bundled, I think, with the profile. So it has a menu structure that was all sort of set up with selector three when you install it. And then this has got a lot of the software from that Apple three RTR image added on it and a few additions. So I'm gonna to go to the communications. Let's have a look at the modem. So if we hit access three, so this is just looking for the .rs232 driver, which maps with FujiNet to the FujiNet device. So no changes required for access three, just assumes that driver and should work hopefully. Let's have a look. So we hit terminal mode, AT, and then we can dial up a bulletin board. Hopefully we should connect to the captain quarters. Um, maybe it can detect the terminal properly. Let's have a look here. There we go. Yeah, so that, no, I don't have a lot, I'm not sure what my login is, but yeah, so that's just showing that that, that works. So we can use that modem, you know, unchanged. It just works because the driver is doing the translation to FujiNet. So I think open up or quit or get out of there. I'm just going to do a quick speed through most things here. Um, while I'm here, I just mentioned that the time here, so this has been updated from FujiNet to the driver when it's initialized, where the time one's initialized, it'll grab the uh, the current FujiNet time and, and pop it into SOS. Um, there's a little bit of drama with the, the century digit. SOS doesn't really cope with that. So some of these are going to think it's 1923. So let's have a look now at the CPM device. So CPM one, we need a, a terminal emulator. So we can use access three again for that, but I couldn't find any way to change the, the, the driver name that it uses. It just defaults to .rs232. It's like it's hard coded in. Um, maybe I'm missing where to set it, but so I just copied the program and I used the hex editor and updated it to use the .cpm device name. And that's the only change required here. So we hit this, once it opens the CPM device, it'll start the, the, the CPM emulation on the FujiNet and we get this run CPM. Now the file system for this is hosted on the SD card plugged into the FujiNet. I've copied some of that stuff across, not all. So we can do a directory. You can see it's quite responsive. Um, Access 3 is pretty good at, at sending data in, in nice chunks. We go, I think on the D drawing, we might have WordStar. Let's have a quick little look, just to show that. So the terminal emulation seems to work quite well. So yeah, there we go. Uh, exit out of that. Exit out of my terminal. So that's the, the modem, CPM, time. Let's have a look at the printer. So let's go to say system utilities. Okay, so we've got system utilities up. 
Um, let's go to device handling. Uh, list devices just to generate some output. So normally we would send this to the .console and we just see it on the screen. So we can send it to the .printed driver device and then that will shoot it off to the FujiNet printer. So that's done. If we come here, so I haven't shown you this, but this is the FujiNet web interface. We just go to the FujiNet IP. Um, it has the host list and mount list, so you can you can uh, add disk images from the web interface like we did with config. But also down here, we've got printer settings. It's set to Epson 80. If we hit this, then we get our printout in its nice dot matrix glory from, from the Apple III. So I'll just go back here, quit out of this. So I'll just show you to try and get a, a something bigger print out. If we go to business basic, we open the dot print device as one, and we set the output to the printer. And we first we load a program to print load. list it, that'll go to the printer. So you can see Fujian flashing away. It, it does it in, it's buffering it into 256 byte chunks. So it's pretty efficient. So we're done now. If we go back to the, the GUI hit here. Oh, one thing I <laughs> forgot to do this time again is you need to do a close. So the buffering is relying on the close. So we'll probably find we might be, yeah, we're missing a little bit off the bottom of the printer, but we need to just do a close only in the business basic. For every other application, it opens the printer, prints, closes. So that works quite well with the buffering setup. So I'll do that now. So that's that. Now I'll come back to ISS V3. So it's printer just works. I've done it from VisiCalc, done sheet printouts. I did some graphics print out from there's a basic program to do screenshots. That all works quite nicely. Um, the next one, let's look at the network device. So that's probably FujiNet's killer app, I think, you know, to bring networking to basic and try and make it fairly simple to do and, and get FujiNet to do a lot of the heavy lifting. So let's um, load an example program. Oops. show you this one. So this is using this invocable module. So Business Basic has a uh, way to extend itself and they're a bit like ampersand routines for Applesoft. So this request.invocable module allows you to do control, status, read, write commands directly to SOS. So that's a way we can use to, to talk to FujiNet and control it. So we've got the network device. We open that network device. We've got a URL and we'll, we'll read this and that'll give our IP back. Um, we have to open that URL, send that to FujiNet uh, with some mode parameters and then we send the control command. And then once that's done, we were able to just use input from hash one, which was the network and get the result and print it. So it's fairly simple. This is a little bit messy, but once you use the format, we can just repeat. So that's pretty easy. So we'll just do a run and then we have it. So I've rebooted my router since this. So um, let's do another one. So these are ported from examples from other platforms. So we've got an echo server. So this will listen on the FujiNet IP on that port. And if I go to my laptop here and do a curl command, then I can send some stuff back and forward. And kill the connection and disconnects and this program's listening again. Uh, wrong keyboard. So there we, that's that. So the next one is, um, I'll show you the ISS tracker. So this is probably FujiNet's go-to test for each platform. 
Uh, I've converted, you know, written a business basic version for the Apple III. Um, I've also done a, a Apple III Pascal version and got that to work as well. So that's there. Um, it's, yeah, runs a little bit quicker than the basic one. So this is fetching off the web uh, from a, a HTTP request with JSON in it. And then it's Fujinet's passing the JSON back that came back and getting longitude latitude and then the basic program converting it to screen coordinates and plotting it. So there you go, that's the ISS tracker. So this network device, yeah, it's, it's crazy, yeah. So last thing I think I want to show you is um, just booting off the internal, the floppy emulation. So if I hit the reset on the FujiNet, so that means when we reboot now Apple three, we'll get back to config. And then if we go in here, back into my server and Apple three, We'll go to the system demo was file. So I'm pretty sure this is protected. It's got the sauce protection where it needs the synchronized tracks. Uh, we'll pop this in the first floppy slot. Um, we'll eject, e to eject this guy, go back and then hit escape. And then we should reboot. And because I've got that on that internal connector, it looks like floppy one and then um, then we'll get the floppy up. And hopefully, yeah, there we go. We've got sauce one dot one. And there you go, there's the, the system demo. So yeah, so it just opens another door with that floppy emulation. Um, you know, other things that won't run the, the the diagnostics and some of those other weird disks for the Apple III we can boot up this way. So there you have it. Um, Fujinet, just quite an amazing uh, scope of what it can run and, and, it, and it works really nicely with the Apple III. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed it and thank you. Probably the biggest question is from the hardware, when's it going to be available? And yeah, at, at the moment, I mean, mostly development versions are being used. This Rev1 has just come out. Um, so it just needs a bit more testing. I'll have to defer to the Fujinet guys on whether they're going to sell that there. But I know they've, you know, they're, it's an open, that's a whole thing. And I probably didn't mention that in the video. I mean, Fujinet's open source and always looking for people to contribute and add and help with it. Um, and that's the way that it, it gets along like it does. So I, I think once the design's there, then it'll be, the design will be there on, on, on their, their site and anyone could build one. But I, I get that there's people that just want to buy it, that not hardware people that just want it ready to use. So um, I'll find out a bit more on that and I'll pop it in the Discord. And the only, the only other one that was probably, I think, it was a question from Dave Ottolini and maybe someone else about BOSS and whether we can use that. At, at the moment, my um, SOS HD boot setup doesn't work with BOSS. I did have a bit of a go with that a while ago and I haven't gotten back to it. Um, I did start to have a look at that a couple of weeks ago. I, I've just got to get a little bit more fed income and, and have a bit of a look into that. So, um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll have that as an option maybe. Um, and that was pretty much it. it. It doesn't need the Rev1 hardware to, there's only one thing I think for the floppy emulation um, that needed the Rev1 um, hardware. Other than that, it's uh, anything will work on it. Yeah. So I didn't leave too much time for <laughs> questions, but that's the way it is. But I'll, I can answer anything else on the Discord. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a, I, I think this is a, Myself, I would say this, this seems very uh, exciting in that it's kind of lowering lowering the barrier, just making it sort of easier to play with stuff. And um, Fujinet should be pretty accessible pretty soon. So um, yeah, you know. um, it was was super nice to actually. It's probably got me more on physically on my uh, Apple three and programming in Basic that I that I haven't you know haven't done that for ages, and it was really enjoyable. So hopefully it does the same for others. <laughs>